Oh, we're rolling. We're All right, cool. So for three, two, one. Hello. Good morning. Hi. Sorry. Good afternoon. It's good just afternoon. past twelve. Hi, Matt. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Thanks. Thanks for coming in. I really appreciate that. My pleasure. I'm glad we made this uh, work. Fine. I had to cancel last week. That's fine. It yeah. happens. That's what happens when you are creative. <laughs> Everything is yeah. just all very last minute, isn't it? Hmm. Um, so before we're going to go, do you mind just giving a very quick introduction of what are you all about? My actual quick introduction, or do you want me to just introduce myself? Quickly? Introduce yourself quickly, yeah. <laughs> um, for context, I've got a YouTube intro in which I state my um, who I am and what I do in about three seconds. But I often I've fail. seen that one. I have to like re repeat that quite a lot to get it right. Anyways, uh, my name is Matthew van der Put, or van der Putte, as we say it in Dutch. I am a Belgian. I am a time lapse and hyperlapse photographer, a travel filmmaker, an educator. Um, there's like a range of things I can I can call myself, but mostly it's time lapse photography, mm -hmm. which is what I've been doing for the last eight or so years. Uh, I've been living in Australia in Sydney for the last six, I think, six years. And I recently moved uh, back to Europe. I moved mm -hmm. to London, uh, chasing my girlfriend around, who was why I moved to Sydney oh. originally. Um, she moved here eight months ago, and I followed um, a couple of months after that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I've been living in London for the last little while, traveling a lot, because traveling from Sydney to anywhere is quite expensive and takes a while. Traveling mm -hmm. from London to anywhere is super easy. It's easy, and cheap easy, and fast. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I guess it's probably one of the best kind of points of living in London. I mean, there's like, what, seven, eight airports yeah. around the city? Absolutely. You want to go I've to done them. almost all of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know them by heart. I know exactly where the toilets are and the yeah. best places to, yeah. I don't know, get a coffee, mm. I guess. Yeah, wow. Okay, but why, well, how old were you when you moved to Sydney then? I was uh, 23, I think. Wow, was it the first time when you just went so far out of Europe? Pretty much. Well, yeah. I mean, I've traveled a bit to the US before that, mm. but um, I... Uh, I backstory why I moved to Australia. I had a uh, you know a bad breakup and, and you know some life stuff. So I was like, I'm going to clear my mind um, across the world, uh, do a road trip there with some friends. Mm. Um, I had a friend visiting there, and we just had a little group of people. Traveled to Sydney, drove north, and then in the last uh, week of that three and a half week trip, I think I met a girl um, at this like you know fairy tale like picnic. It was like a mutual friend's birthday, and. Um, yeah, we just kind of started talking um, online after that event. And two months after that, I was back in Belgium already for uh, those few months. I um, Yeah, we just didn't stop talking. So I booked a flight to go back to Sydney, told my boss that I was going to go back. And he's like, well, you can't. You can't do that. So you got to quit your job. I was like, OK, I'll quit. Um, yeah, kind of took a bit of a, a risk, a bit of a gamble. And then I moved uh, to Sydney. Uh, I was going to scope out, you know, what it was would be like to be there, to be with with Amelia, my current girlfriend still. Um, and it was it was lovely. It was great. I was, you know, obviously there was a plan B. What if it doesn't work out? What if we don't actually get along in real life? But uh, no, we, um, yeah, it worked out really well. Hit it off quite well. Yeah, hit it off. Was it quite a big shock culturally? Go from Belgium, which is quite yeah. a small country, isn't it? Yeah. And you're in Europe. You're 100%. very close to everything. Yeah going to Sydney it, it's opened my mind a lot um, to different cultures to different way of life um, I've definitely changed as a as a person in the way I, I look at the world and, and society um, Belgium is very small and in my opinion um, from my experience quite small-minded uh, from how I've where I've grown up and, and who I've um, hung out with and how I've experienced that and being in Australia um, yeah, it's just been wildly different. And travel as well, because I travel a lot for work, um, has shown me so many different cultures and so many different types of societies um, that it's, yeah, as I said, opened up my mind to. Massively. Um, yeah, so in my opinion, you know, travel is one of the best things you can do because it changes you in, it you really know, does. ideally for the better. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you don't want to become a pessimist person yeah. looking at some of the yeah. aspects of the traveling, yeah. but yeah, I guess it's one of those ones. But what were you doing in Belgium before then? What was your job? I was a video editor. So mm. before that, um, I went to film school for four years. Um, to I got my degree um, in uh, film and video editing, mm -hmm. uh, documentary mainly. And I was a video editor slash director slash camera operator for an online educational company. 
um, which was fun, but it was easy. And I talk a lot about comforts, you know, comfort zones and um, that definitely was very deep inside a comfort zone, which also made me realize I should take that risk and move or at least go to Australia because I was just, it was too easy. Like it was mm. good money. It was a fun team, fun, you know, decent enough job, but not challenging at all. I wasn't pushing myself at all. It was just, you know, an easy job. Cruising, just kind of just drifting. Cruising, and- yeah. Just living kind of for the weekend. And I, yeah, I prefer my life right now which yeah. doesn't i mean you don't really account for weekends because as a freelance creative you can you know is it monday is it wednesday doesn't I only matter because my still girlfriend's like, got like a corporate job so oh. it's like oh it's friday that's fun <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what but she's then, you know, looking you, for you don't really have weekends because you, no. it's always on there's like you know so many emails coming in and you're still you're always busy creating something or thinking about what am i going to create this week or tomorrow or whatever so um you know pros and cons of freelancing i guess I guess, yeah, we all have experienced things like that, trust me. That was a big thing for me. I was also kind of coming from a corporate background and same, suffocating, but good money. And then you kind of go like, ah, let's go, just make it happen. Never easy. Mm. Very very exciting all the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but, you know, frustrating. And I mean, you get all spectrum of emotions in that job, for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that's quite, that, that is a lot of fun. But hey, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, but did you always know you're going to be... A filmographer? Is that something you always wanted to do? Initially, I wanted to be an actor um, for the very silly reason, but still valid. I I stand by it. That uh, blooper reels looked so much fun Mm. to be on set and just goofing around with, you know, your colleagues and laughing and then being famous and making money from doing something that just looked so much fun. So blooper reels is, of you know, shows like Friends and stuff like that. Um, it, It seemed like just the most fun thing. Um, And then I tried to get into, um, so after high school, I tried to get into drama school um, and there was this entry entrance exam and I, you know, studied my lines, you know, had like a couple of A4s of texts that we had to memorize and perform. And instead of performing it, I I just kind of spoke it with not much emotion because I was, I didn't know anything about acting. I just, I wanted to I just wanted to do, I wanted to be an actor. In my mind, I was like, you know, this is a clean slate, fresh start for you um, teachers to teach me how to be, to perform, I guess. And I still, I mean, I still kind of stand by that. I feel like I told them, like, because as I was, as I was doing these lines, they just stopped me and they're like, all right, that's good. Thank you. <laughs> Next. I was like, oh, fuck. That's, sorry. No, that's, like, oh, shit, that's, that's rough. Um, I was like, look, hold on. Let's, mo- let's not move too fast here. Think about it. <laughs> I am like, a new, like so. I don't know anything, so you can mold me In into whatever you want me to be. Yeah, There's yeah. no like, you know, I don't have any preconceptions about drama or acting. Um, but yeah, it didn't work. And then I realized I just want to be in the film industry somehow. I still want to be involved. Mm. I still want to do fun things. So I found a degree in filmmaking, or in the film world, I guess, and that was that without was entrance exams mm. that I could just roll into. So I did that, and that was, um, I guess, translated from Dutch. It's um, image, um, image, sound, or audio, and uh, editing, mm. uh, which was like a three-part degree. You had to choose which one of those three you wanted to do after six months, and then you specialized in that. So a lot of camera operators come from that school in Belgium. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's called the Ritz, R-I-T-S, I think it's called now, mm. in Brussels. So I went to school in Brussels for four years, and then I, um, yeah, I graduated with a degree in film editing. And then I did that boring office job uh, for a year, and then I moved to Australia. Oh, that's good, actually, yeah. you know, for a year, that's wow. wow. So I feel like I've kind of seen what it's like to work in an office, work in a team, you know, work on projects with other people. But I much prefer the freelance life, which, I mean, also it has, it's got negatives as well, mm, you know. I agree. If you don't do an active effort, if you don't actually try to... Um, go outside you just you're going to be inside yeah always and i've noticed that a lot i have to i should really go work in a co-working space or some you know members club or whatever because i'm just sitting at home in your man cave (laughs) editing the videos just editing and like writing and (laughs) filming stuff and just yeah if i don't like i like to cook so i go and shop and buy food and and then i cook but still like going to the shops is like a two-minute walk yeah it's not really let's go and have a chat isn't it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so I think, yeah, a co-working space um, 
would be good for me. Might be a good idea. Mm. Yeah, because we run into the same thing. Sometimes we'll just spend three days literally just going, we have a Tesco Express, which is like two yeah, minutes exactly. walking yeah, distance. It's too easy. It's yeah. nothing. And you kind mm. of gone, it's, it's a BBC building actually next door. No way. Sometimes I feel like, shall I just hang around here in this coffee <laughs> shop and pretend that we also work for the BBC and be it's like, a meeting. hey guys, <laughs> this is the project, by the way, yeah. we're pitching. Would you be interested? Yeah. <laughs> I've got a meeting at some point. It's not confirmed yet, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, it, it might be today, but it might be in two weeks' time, but we are yeah. here. I guess you are need to be an opportunist i guess you know and look at this in a very bright side because mm. you don't have you know kpis or the manager who'll be like chop chop we need to do this and that you almost are your own boss but yeah and it, that you know you need that discipline you need to yeah. um to me for example monday's admin day i get all of my you know you whatever it is admin stuff out of the way is it a um, bunch of emails that i've had you know lying around collecting from the end of last week or <laughs> you know, sending out invoices or doing my, you know, my bank statements, all that stuff. Mm. I do that on Monday um, because everybody hates Mondays. And I'm like, you know, I'll just, I'll join that. Mm. I'll join that crowd. I'll do that stuff that I don't enjoy as much on a Monday. Just get it over with. Um, But I actually do like Mondays because it's like a new start of the week. And, you know, you can plan a bunch of stuff. Mm. And there's like five full days that you can do stuff. Because on the weekends, I try to not do too much work because my girlfriend's a lawyer. So she... um. She works pretty late throughout yeah, the week. I can imagine. And then we just try and spend the weekends together. Yeah. Right. Okay. How is the life in London has been working out for you? It's been great. Uh, yeah. The more time I spend here, the more fun it gets. Because uh, mm. you get to meet, see meet more people, um, find more things to do. And um, we recently moved to Shoreditch, which is um, a, a more lively area than Angel, uh, where we were before. Definitely am. Um, pretty rowdy, pretty loud. We're right behind um, the oh. main street. So it like... <laughs> I explained it like it turns into a, a jungle, jungle yeah. yeah just absolute insanity. ambulance sirens going yeah. off oh my god friday yeah. saturday night crazy um, yeah. but so much fun for like a you know a short period of time i think probably after a year and a bit you'll get sick of it yeah we'll leave that uh with my girls when we just moved to london for work um stoke newington so just slightly mm-hmm. up there and oh god yeah so much fun at the very beginning, you yeah. know, let's go to this coffee shop. It's a new coffee yeah. shop. Like, We're you know, in you that honeymoon phase still. Yeah, I know, yeah. It's <laughs> disturbed wood and local arts and it's all a yeah. bit like, you know, 15 pounds for avocado smash and you kind of oh, go it's like, horribly expensive. oh, yeah. why? Yeah. You know, yeah. like a Whole Foods is like a normal mm. thing and you kind of go like, yeah, it's 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 lovely, but yeah. like I do prefer my one pound, you know, bread and, yeah. and milk and whatever else mm. not. So yeah, it's it's still a lovely area though. Yeah. I like going there because uh, mm-hmm. my majority of my mates are still living there. So every single time it's like, let's go somewhere, it's always shortage. So, <laughs> so like, Well, we've got some friends living like Clapham and, and other places. Mm. Um, Good for you. <laughs> whenever, whenever they go out it's always like somewhere else we have to do this big trek to go there oh yeah but lately you know they've been organizing things in shortage and like sweet (laughs) i live like 100 meters from where we're gonna go oh that's amazing i mean honestly because for me honest like traveling an hour to one way in london is acceptable ish Mm -hmm. like 50 55 minutes i can do as soon Mm -hmm. as i can see on a city map it goes 75 minutes i'm like no not fun yeah no. uh can we just maybe organize it somewhere else thank <laughs> you very middle. much yeah meet in the middle yeah. yeah but my mates are like yeah but shortage is so cool what we're we going to be doing in soho and i'm like oh god all right fine mm. hipsterville let's go to shortage then isn't mm. it oh, wow. what are your thoughts on soho um when it comes to street photography i love it <laughs> yeah <laughs> you yeah. can get those very interesting characters on mm-hmm. the streets and when it comes uh, to when it comes to photography i love it would I go deliberately there to spend my money? I don't think so. A lot of money, yeah. No, it's a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. There is um, a place, when when we shoot with Jan together and we happen to be in Soho, we love Bondadis. So there is Bondadis literally just off, I think mm-hmm. it's Water Street. Mm-hmm. I think it is literally just one of the main Soho streets and it's just tucked away in a corner. Yeah. So it's literally next to the animal shops where he mm-hmm. gets really excited. <laughs> um, the magazines and all this kind of stuff. And I just go to Bondadis and get some nice, lovely ramen soup. Yeah, nice. And that's, oh, that's, that's good. I haven't had ramen. Uh, have I? No, I haven't had ramen here. Mm. Where's your favorite ramen shop? I think Bon Daddy's will be one of them. Uh, tonkatsu, it depends on the branch. Oh, no, I've which been to go. Tonkatsu, yeah. Which yeah. was hyped up a lot by a lot of people. And I was like, mm, mm. this is okay ramen. It's okay ramen, but yeah. But having lived in Sydney, oh, which I is think you're spoiled for choice pretty there, much it? in Asia, which yeah. is I find you know, people talking about migration so strange because I'm like, you're in 
it's yeah. you know, anyways that's a whole different conversation yeah. but <laughs> um yeah we're so blessed with the 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 variety and the, the quality of asian food in australia is amazing especially in a hub like sydney mm. um so ramen there yeah we're very blessed Absolutely. I mean, we used to watch um, MasterChef Australia mm. a lot. Out of all the MasterChefs, that was my favorite. And just the produce they tend to work with. Sometimes I was like, we wish in the UK we oh, yeah. had something mm-hmm. relatively, like remotely close to yeah. this. Even going to like a normal, <clears throat> uh, like a Coles or whatever, the amount of vegetables that you can buy there um, that my parents would have never even seen yeah. in Belgium. Like, what, <laughs> what is what that? What is this? <laughs> yeah. It's- they were very confused when they visited. Wow, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. So when it comes, we had quite a big thing here in London happening with the whole Japanese food. Mm -hmm. So a lot of like Japanese burgers and the Wagyu places were opening. And um, yeah, ramen is something that is just very close because I'm coming from Estonia. So soup's something very hearty. We live in cold climates eventually. So this is something that you're like drawn to. Mm. And when we are shooting outside, and honestly, when it's five degrees outside, (laughs) after three hours, you got like... We're going for yeah. that ramen now. Yeah. That sometimes used to be my sole motivation to get out of the house. I'm <laughs> shoot, sorry. Uh, yeah, as an I'm a horrible. Yeah. I'm a horrible person. Like, what's your motivation to shoot today? Well, I'm really looking forward to that ramen in five hours. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. So here we go. Talking about motivations of mm-hmm. a you know videographer and photographer. Um, yeah. yeah. Happy days, isn't it? Mm. Um, when so if. If you were doing filming, how was the whole process then went from filming to photography? Of course, they are quite close, isn't Mm -hmm. it? But still, I think being a videographer and and photographer, you still need to have two almost like separate minds of Mm -hmm. how you're seeing Mm -hmm. the frames. So how that process then went for you Mm -hmm. from being filmographer, and that's what you did, an editor, to then being into photography and doing time-lapsing? It kind of went the other way because my editing degree didn't give us any... um, any education about how to shoot it was Mm. strictly how to edit which is a great base to start if you want to learn how to shoot because as an editor you know what you like to edit and you know what works and you know what doesn't work you know for example i mean technically when a shot's you know like too short like i wish they shot even if it's 10 more frames just to have this you know the the reaction that you can cut to or whatever so i discovered time-lapse photography when i was in film school in i think 2010 or 11 started doing time-lapse photography, which is obviously, you know, making photos and then creating a video file out of that. So it's a blend of how do you frame stuff up for a photo or for a video, you know, classically working with easy compositions, you're shooting landmarks. So it's, you know, it's not too difficult to frame things up. So that's where I started. I got really good at time-lapse and I got really well known for time-lapse across the world because, um, you know. And I think many people were doing that at that point. Yeah, just, you know, the golden age of of time-lapse. I met up with um, my friend Mattia who, was in that same um, same era. We started around the same time, or maybe he started a bit earlier, but we were talking about how fun that was back in the day, in like 2011, 2010, 2011, to see, you know, the rise of time-lapse and, and this, this group of time-lapse photographers globally. Mm. Um, we all kind of started in that, or at least we, we got to know each other through the rise of because time-lapse of that. of that era. Is that the Finnish guy? Uh, the, the, the Terrier, you mean? No, the Mattia. Uh, uh, no, Mattia... Bicky, he's Italian. Uh, Matti uh, Hapoya, I think. Yeah, yeah I thought this is the one I'm talking about. But he's a videographer, videographer. Yeah. So he's the one with Peter McKinnon crew. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I met his brother in Sydney, uh, Tepo. Oh. Uh, I did like a five time lapse tips with him last year. <laughs> nice. Super nice guy, yeah. Oh. Um, YouTube as well, you know, YouTube community. Anyways, the so got good at time lapse. And then I was like, I want to diversify my skill set. I want to shoot video. I was always kind of shooting video. Mm. I was, you know, doing vlogs and all that stuff. But I wanted to get better at it because from a um, freelance point of view, I needed to diversify my skill set to, as people would call it, you know, protect your downsides or whatever, have more ways of making money. So I was like, I need to get better at video. So I decided to just, you know, buy a decent camera and I was like, I'll just, it'll open up doors. And and it did. Um, I bought, um, what was I shooting on? Like I started with a 5D3 and then I had another one, two for time-lapse and then I had a 5DR, which mm. I thought would be better for video, which was horrible. Got rid of that camera. Um, then I got a 1DX Mark II a couple of years ago. And then I, it really kind of took off, shot a lot of like tourism videos and stuff mm. for brands, which, um, you know, was very much focused on video as opposed to time-lapse, but always a bit of time-lapse in there because that's kind of what sets me apart from other video creators yeah. that don't have that big background in time-lapse. So as far as how does that um, impact, you know, how you look at 
working, you know, do you shoot photos, do you shoot video? It's this big blend. But whenever I'm working on a project, I'll just have a shot list and work, you know, I need X amount of photos. So let's focus on getting photos. Or if it's a complex shoot, for example, with cars where it takes a lot of time and effort to put a yeah. car in a certain position or you, yeah, you just got to deal with that. You try and prepare everything in advance. Um, so you just, you know, your pre-production takes up quite some Correct. time and energy. Yeah. Because that's the only way to do it, really. Yeah. You don't want to drag out a shoot too long. It just costs so much time and money. And also the energy, yeah, because I think this is exactly the same thing. When I'm shooting the videos, of course, you have some sort of notion of what you need to be doing. When we started doing hyperlapses, it's all about pre-production. Mm -hmm. If you haven't scouted the area, if you do not know yeah. the approximate you know, distance from A to B, if, if you don't even know how it's going to look like in certain time of the day, yeah. that Light, can go straight gets, away yeah. like this. We went and shot some of the stuff and it was on um, Dumbo Bridge in New York. Oh, yeah. The amount of people... Crazy, that's right? one thing fine but then that look at that, look that look point? Up at that point yeah and we we <laughs> spent probably four and a half hours and i was like end of october it's extremely windy extremely cold and you're standing there because we do all our hyperlapses handheld mm. you're standing there holding that camera cramps everywhere <laughs> and then you have obviously another chinese tourism board coming yeah. across and you're like great yeah but then there are also the cars i didn't realize that yeah, the cars it's like actually a public street it's yeah. a public street it's isn't it so annoying to have like a oh my god or... we had you know what we had we had to buy chalk mm. to go and put some crisscrosses so in and out in and out oh literally <laughs> Yeah, at that point you know it's one shooting then we're swapping around another yeah. one is shooting and you continue doing oh, that until you get to the point how long and did it take you to shoot the like two four and a half hours oh no way on and off because there was such so much traffic and we were there well i mean because idea was let's do sunset mm. of course how many people decided to do and take a picture of that during the sunset? Millions. Loads. Loads yeah. of people. So we had an option, sunset or, sun, uh, or sunrise. Sunrise, I think, it was quite cloudy. And we got to the location 6 o'clock in the morning. And it was just nothing. And we're like, we have to come back here yeah. during the sunset. Sunset was gorgeous. But because of that amount of traffic, we just had to be like, that's what you do, you know? Do you reckon that those crowds, mm. I talk about this a lot with um, friends that are, on and off social media. Um, my friend who's visiting now, for example, he doesn't have, ins I mean, he's got Instagram. Mm. He's, he's a he's a sculptor. He doesn't manage it himself. He's um, My agency kind of does like, that for him. Huh? Yeah, yeah, something like that. Um, so he doesn't know what Instagram is. He doesn't have Facebook. He's, mm. <laughs> you know, he's one of those very alternative guys. I like him. But um, <laughs> I'm like, you know, we went to a couple of spots in London and he's like, oh my God, it's so busy. Like uh, the, what's the bridge called that goes to St. Paul's? Millennium? Oh, Millennium Bridge, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, amount of, the amount of, yeah. yeah, the amount of, is it millennial or mil millennial? Millen I don't know. Oh my God. Yeah. Could be millennial because there were so many yeah. millennials taking I think it's millennial Instagrams, bridge, yeah. <laughs> like the exact same shot. Yeah. Anyways, question is, do you reckon it's Instagram, Instagram specifically the app that influences people to, like obviously now in this age to go to that, you know, the Dumbo Bridge spot in Brooklyn or other places, or is it just generally the internet, the rise of the internet? I think definitely Instagram. You see, you have to look at the Instagram positive and negative. You mm. know, I think Instagram is the one platform that made a lot of people, you know, um, move their asses off the couch and start traveling. So mm. this is the positive, like right? Like Pokemon Go. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah. I, I don't understand why people got so upset. They're all on their phones outside. I'm like, well, at least they're at outside. At least they're outside. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But, but we. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is if it wasn't for Instagram, would it have been something else? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not necessarily Instagram. It's mm -hmm. like this was the app at that time that, you know, caused yeah. it could have been Definitely. another platform. Definitely. And I think what's going to happen now with the whole frustration that Instagram is building now with people, I think there is an opportunity for another brand or another platform to come in across as well. Mm -hmm. So I might be talking out of my, you know, mm -hmm. butt here, but <laughs> it might be the case that in a couple of years we'll see something else mm -hmm. that will serve people in a way that Instagram used to serve them till the point is going to get so big that it has to start, mm. you know, in introducing algorithms and mm. all the kind of stuff that Instagram is doing at the moment now. Because if you look at it, once Facebook being bought and in direction it went to, it wasn't really positive. And now it's the same company doing that for the Instagram. So I feel like mm. you Although just... Although I do feel they're trying to reverse certain things. Uh, yeah. You know, bringing certain, um, you know, like more privacy regulations and, and changing the algorithm. Recently, I've noticed... Uh, purely on my Facebook mm. uh, feed that I'm seeing much more of my friends' things as opposed to brands and, and stuff like that. 
And I read somewhere that that was an active, uh, you know, a conscious decision yeah. on their end to go back to, I guess, because a lot of young people have left Facebook as a platform. They call it, you know, it's more for gray people or whatever. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, they're aware of that and they're always tweaking, obviously, algorithms yeah. and trying to get people to stay on there. I find it really interesting because people's like, oh, well, my, MySpace disappeared and, and, you know, Snapchat went down. But now Snapchat's had a massive, Gun you know, boost again boost because of the, the filters on there. Yeah. I think, you know, we're in new territory. There's no way of saying if it's going to disappear or not happen. because it's never been at this scale. So, And it's it's developing so quickly. Mm. And, I think and it's it, just such yeah. a massive monopoly, which mm. is obviously quite bad. Like, no, monopoly is great. So, yeah, but who what knows? What I realized with Instagram is it only shows me what I'm interested in. So it barely shows me anything outside of my interest so if i'm liking mostly street photography let's say videographers and time lapses it wouldn't show me anything else it's not like maybe i need that but it just i hate that i'm being put in a bracket and that's the folder yeah. i am in yeah and well, I, it, i'm not even being you know mm. even considered as a human being that i might be even interested yeah. maybe in some food photography i don't mm. even know like it's been you name decided it. for you that yes. it's like you're gonna you're gonna get street <laughs> yeah that's what you're getting yeah. now and yeah. i'm like oh I, you know i follow probably about a thousand people i want to mm. i want to see a thousand people's stuff because i follow them for a reason mm. you, but yeah all i see i like off the top of my head i can name like the 15 names i see the most in my feed and i feel like that's all it is but that's so you know so weird and i think that's what brings me to youtube now mm -hmm. um when did you start doing youtube and what was the main goal because i remember you started it and then you almost like left it there for a bit and then you picked it up mm. yeah my account's from 07 so oh wow Old school, yeah. OG. early days, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the early days of the platform when it was way different. I'd love to see um, the layout of YouTube and Google, okay. you know, from 12 years ago. But yeah, I started in 07 just because I, um, I've i always been making videos and I always had like dumb ideas or like family vacation videos, or little road trip things with friends, like silly edits. I've always been that person in our family and friend group to do that. Um, little known fact, my Username now obviously is Matt Joes, um, but that originally was T Joes, which was short as a joke in, in joke with our friends was T Joes the movie maker. So I had you know my old website and channel name and everything was Tues the movie maker in Dutch. Um, <laughs> now it's Matt Joes, which is more it's shorter and easier and it's a better username across all platforms. But yeah, my uh, channel. From 07, I just had it there every time I had a video, I'd post it there purely to share it with friends. Every now and then I'd have something go crazy. Like one of my early videos was when I tried to jump uh, from a trampoline into a pool and I, <laughs> I didn't clear the uh, distance. I landed on the side of the oh, pool. God. <laughs> but I managed to like duck and roll into the water. It looked uh, bad, but it was all right. It just kind of hurt my ankle a bit. But yeah, that that got like, I don't know, a couple 10,000 views or okay. maybe it could be at 200K views now. It's, it's you know, really potato quality video <laughs> but that's the type of stuff that was on that channel and then when i maybe it was before i moved to australia so yeah probably um seven eight years ago when i started doing time lapse because i noticed time lapse initially on vimeo yeah, i was like oh this is the platform to post things but then vimeo as a platform was way smaller than youtube so i made a conscious decision to dis not distance myself, but to separate myself from all the other time-lapse photographers that I was talking about earlier. Everyone was posting on Vimeo. And I'm like, that's cool and all, but I want to post on YouTube because there's just many more people here. Uh, there's the numbers are here. Whereas Vimeo is like art directors and, you know, creative directors that are on there scouting footage or locations, whatever. And I'm glad I made that decision because then after, how long was it? In 2013, I made it like a time-lapse show reel of all my footage from, you know, a whole year of kind of shooting. And that went viral on YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, so it hit, at the time, um, I think almost 300,000 views in a day. Uh, I posted on Reddit and went to like number one and just, it blew up. And then it still kept collecting videos, uh, views, I mean, sorry. Um, it's almost at a million now, years and years later. I'm like 10,000 views off of it. So nice. Almost. <laughs> That's my first video with a million views. Ben. I don't think that would have happened on Vimeo. Um, and immediately I, I got so a lot of subscribers from that. Yeah. And then, you know, if you look at Vimeo now as a platform, I really, really disagree with how they operate as a business because I uploaded a lot of videos back in the day with, um, you know, have a pro or a plus subscription. If I now want to stop that subscription, which costs me, I don't know, 100, 150 bucks for a year, I'll lose the videos that I've uploaded 
while I was on that subscription. Oh, really? Yeah. And I'm like, they kind mm-hmm. of keep you hostage or keep your videos hostage. Yeah. And I was talking to Mattia about this as well. And everyone's unhappy about it. Mm. But now they're like, yeah. I mean, I just think that's a really scummy way of operating. It is a bit, yeah. yeah. And then um, another reason I chose YouTube is because obviously Google bought YouTube um, years ago. Which is, I remember my dad actually walking into our living room like, Google just bought YouTube for a billion dollars. I was like, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, but, Dad. Yeah, it's cool. I kind of remember that moment. Um, mm. Because he was always, you know, keeping tabs on things. He's like, these two dudes started this video channel or, you know, video website. Yeah. One, I don't know the details. But um, I, I kind of realized, you know, years later that it's so ingrained in our um, culture. It's part of Google. Again, obviously, Monopoly, quite bad, but very powerful. Because, you know, put in any time-lapse search term and you'll find one of my videos yeah. you know how to time lapse how to hyperlapse all these things uh which to me was a conscious decision to post on that platform because it was ingrained in seo so much culture better. technology yeah. so powerful so many numbers that uh land on uh your videos because you know google's going to prefer to show youtube over vimeo and no one's looking for videos on facebook so yeah, that was another one mm. that and the fact that there's so many more people on youtube and then you started vlogging yeah, and then I started vlogging. <laughs> mm. <laughs> did quite a few things. Um, I I would love to know a little bit more about you. Did uh, a trip around Utah with mm. complete stranger. Yeah, and I loved it. Yeah, it has. You need to have a lot of guts to do that in order to go somewhere with complete stranger and spend so many days mm-hmm. with somebody you have never ever ever met before. I know. How was it? <laughs> it was really fun. Yeah. I loved. I love the story behind it. If someone, it's funny because. Looking back at my Australia story, some people, um, you know, when I had already done my big gamble, my big risk of I'm going to quit my job, move to Australia to be with this girl that I met once, you know, see what happens. But someone told me like, oh, this couple, they've only known each other for three months, but they're moving in together. And I'm like, oh, that's crazy. And they're like, hold on, what you did is also very crazy. And then, you know, fast forward, I've done similar stuff where I just take a, a gamble, a risk. And this Utah one uh, was recently. So for context uh, for the listeners, I saw a tweet from a guy I was following on Twitter months ago, maybe six months ago. And he's like, I want to do an astrophotography road trip through Utah. And I'm looking for a road trip partner or like a road trip buddy. And I just replied, tweeted, I'm like, hey, I'll fly in and join you for that. And he's like, DM me. And I did. And then uh, we spoke uh, on a video chat once. And just, you know, hey, I'm Matt. He's like, hey, I'm Abdul. Is that you know, it? Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> and that's, I, I filmed that, um, I that saw first that convo, the which video, then yeah. I put in the video. And yeah, months later, I think three months after that, we um, we both flew to Utah. He flew in from Boston. I flew in from London. Uh, wow. <laughs> really silly. I landed, because I did another US trip before the Utah trip. I did a, a big Kentucky bus tour, flew back to London from New Orleans, and then I flew back to Utah four days later. For this other road trip, which is horrible as far as you know, money greenhouse. Yeah, yeah, I mean money, money, yeah. <laughs> money jet lag. But I'm, my concern is like greenhouse yeah. gas emissions, which is horrible with flying. I'm really bad at it. But it's, every flight I do, um, you try to offset. I offset it uh, with that extra cost. And oh, sorry, no. Um, yeah, because I just feel guilty about it. Um, it is a lot, actually, just to kind of yeah, it's crazy. It. I think I went to WWF and we were flying a lot last year, like crazy amounts of flights were taken. And that was literally 75 to 80% of my emissions were just because of the traveling. And mm. I was like, wow. It's nuts. Yeah. It's nuts. It's, yeah. It's I love, I love trains. Same. I love trains. When I go back to Belgium, it's, you know, the Eurostar, which goes like 350Ks an hour and yeah. is way more, um, you know, responsible when it comes to emissions no absolutely and europe trains are amazing yeah. uk not so much yeah oh it's horrible and in um australia it's pretty much non-existent oh really there's no high-speed trains there's no proper connection from like sydney to melbourne or brisbane it's really quite sad considering the distances you would assume i know right yeah every election cycle they're like oh high-speed trains let's talk about it but then nothing actually you know comes from it mm. anyways anyways yeah. to utah mm. so i fly to salt lake city and we he had, uh, abdul had rented a car and we meet each other and like, you know, what up, dude? <laughs> Let's go shoot some stuff. And then we went on a 10-day road trip through Utah with the goal being um, shooting astrophotos. He's a, he likes shooting astrophotography. He's got, a, he's got a job and he does a photography on the side. Mm-hmm. And I, I was just looking for, you know, to make An excuse. A story content uh, to see the state because Utah is absolutely Phenomenal, it's so gorgeous. It? They've got mm-hmm. so many national parks. 
um, you know, Brian Zion, Arches, all this stuff. It was just mind blowing, super diverse as well. And some really dark skies. So we, um, yeah, spent 10 days cruising around Utah, getting to know each other, shooting photos, hanging out. And by the end of it, we were both kind of over it. Mm, no, okay. <laughs> he uh, was missing his girlfriend quite a bit, as was I. Mm. But I was mainly, I was just, I was so done with traveling because I just finished that Kentucky trip, which was two or two and a half weeks. And before that, I was somewhere else in Europe, maybe like Antwerp, Amsterdam, or even back in Sydney. I don't know. I've done a, a stupid amount of travel this year already, even though I was going to take it easy. Oh, yeah. But yeah, as that all. never really happens. <laughs> so yeah, Utah, I uh, made a video about it, called it... Um, I think a road trip with a stranger or something. Yeah. And the feedback on it was really was really nice. It didn't do well, like, views-wise. I mean, it did all right, but you always want more, I guess. I I will come back on the views yeah. in a second. But the feedback was great. And yeah. people were like, wow, this is such a great story. Mm. And, you know, it's a great story to tell. And I'm really, really happy I did it because, you know, obviously Abdul and I became really, you know, good friends, but then we met other people on the trip. And the experiences, the, the, the views, like, unfor unforgettable stuff. Yeah, I haven't been there, but basically what happened this at the beginning of this year, I went to, to hike to Kilimanjaro and oh, no we, it was, it was, wow. And then I went with my friend who is, she's a wedding photographer from Estonia, but she's also a filmographer as well. So everything that she does, she always tries to carry her 10 kilo backpack on top of everything else. And I was just like, I salute you on that. Cause mm. I went with my very small Fuji X-T3 and I was yeah. like, this is what I'm taking. I'm Jealous. not taking anything else yeah. at all. Uh, which is a beautiful camera when it comes mm. to video. Uh, so I was like, this is my limitation. And I have to work with that. I don't have 200 nice. millimeter lens mm -hmm. and that's it. Mm. If I can only see that far, this is what I'm going to do. And that's yeah. what I'm going to concentrate on. And we did, there was this <clears throat> very, the first time we went on this high altitude, which was almost 4,000 meters. Mm. Are you okay with meters, right? Yeah. 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 Um, and Australian. Yeah. We all have the, <laughs> the system that makes most sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and that was the first night when I felt really rough. Mm. Like my heart was beating, so racing. Did you go straight to that altitude? No, no, it was a proper seven yeah. day hike. So okay. we're constantly taking it. You worked it. up to it. Yeah, 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 absolutely. But that's when it was first night, I was like, oh my God, it's so easy. People are like, yeah, it's very difficult. I'm like, how is it difficult? It's all cool. It's yeah. all nice and breezy. And as soon as we went through 3.9, I was like, okay, this yeah. is not cool. Headache, like there is no tomorrow. Mm. Hard is like as if you just ran a marathon. And um, that was the first night when she was like, hey, like look at the stars. They're so phenomenal. Like yeah. they're so beautiful. You're so close to the stars. You can't even, I, mm -hmm. I don't know if you can explain it, but it's just like you almost can touch them and mm. the sky is just filled with them. Yeah, there's I, so much less atmospheric pollution as uh, well because there's like sure. four kilometers of air like nothing particles nothing floating around at all. above absolutely yeah so when we put a time lapse on for we only did probably like 45 minutes because both of us would just knack it and we had mm. to wake up seven hours later to kind of continue going up so we were like that's amazing that's fantastic i love it but let's just like calm our passion here a little yeah. bit okay because she was let's like yeah we're gonna do it for three hours yeah. i was like no no <laughs> it's also cold it's like minus two degrees we had yeah. to keep like we literally put it outside of our tent so we literally just yeah, had to yeah. unzip oh, it to it like have that. a look at it like okay it's all still going like zip it up and yeah. just go back luxury to bed. time lapse luxury time lapse yeah because <laughs> it's never the case is it <laughs> but um of course what happened there was quite a few people going to the toilets and the torches yeah. were kind of going out yeah. and i was a bit like oh, dude, you really had to do that mm. but in general it was so beautiful the stars are just mesmerizing yeah. they're just there so i can imagine 10 days of doing yeah. this it's mm -hmm. quite awesome yeah but then again your i think not timetable but the graphic must be nuts then so what you then film over the night mm. and then how when do you sleep i mean yeah it was horrible because <laughs> it's just like <laughs> Get up for sunrise? Yeah, I might get up for sunrise. You know, see what it's like and then mm. drive during the day, a couple hours, three, four, five hours, and then mm -hmm. location scout mm. for the night stuff, um, shoot sunset, try and get food on the way. Um, yeah, the timing was the was horrible, mm. <laughs> which, you know, also added to the, by the end of the trip, we were just both like, all right, we're done. Yeah, like, <laughs> Let's go. Yeah. Um, speaking of the altitude stuff, uh, years ago, I went on a shoot for... Um, a show called Tales by Light. You can watch it on Netflix now. And I'm, for one of the episodes, I shot the time lapses uh, in India, uh, Nepal, and um, where else did we go? Ah, Bhutan. Mm. In uh, Nepal, we flew from pretty much sea level to um, Lukla Airport, which is um, apparently. I mean, it's one I of believe the highest it, one, isn't it? It's it's high and it's the most dangerous airport in the world. It's a really short and very steep. It's at a quite an angle runway. At the start of it, there's just a cliff. 
and at the end of it, there's a mountainside. So it's a bit hit or miss. When you're flying in, there's there's alarms going off in the plane because it's planes aren't built to fly like that. You're flying next to mountains. You're like, should never see <laughs> the the mountain this close out of my windows. I could touch it almost. Oh so God. there's alarms blaring. You're flying in there, and I think it's I don't know how high it is, but it's it's higher I think than three k uh, meters. And we didn't have any time to acclimatize to the altitude due to the, the filming schedule. So when we got there, then we took a heli to this monastery, which is on the way to Everest Base Camp. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful spot. But oh my God, I got so sick. I think I had a combo of altitude sickness and food poisoning. And I was an absolute wreck. That's the worst. Because yeah. when we were climbing, we had one guy, like, I mean, it honestly can go so sideways <laughs> just because of one small thing. And the mm. guy, I don't know, we all ate exactly the same thing. Yeah. But for some bizarre reason, he woke up next day looking like green, pale mm. as, I don't even know. And he could barely deal with that. And what yeah. happens usually when you are sick on altitude, your your body takes at least three or four times the time yeah. to get over it. So it's a slower process. I felt, I yeah. I'd rarely felt so bad. And also the oxygen level drops drastically. And, and mentally, what I found oh. very, um, v- very dis- disturbing, discerning, is, is you know the fact that you're at altitude and there's no easy way out. It's like the opposite of um, feeling claustrophobic mm. in a small room. You're in like this massive space and there's not enough air and you're feeling bad. And you're like, what if it gets worse? There's no fast way to go home. It was it's not just, like I'm just going to open a door yeah, and I'm just going to get some more air and then I'm just going to yeah, close it off. very scary. You kind of had to, I mean, I had to kind of shut that part of my brain down, the, the, the worry, the anxiety about that stuff because I would have totally freaked out. But everyone there was like, yeah, this isn't, you know, to, just to walk with a camera back from one end of the, the, the field we were on to the other one or like to go up 10 stairs was like, I need to it's sit exhausting. Down. Yeah. It's exhausting. Yeah. yeah. You and have to on, take it really slow. On the way out, we had like a very um, short time time gap to take the heli back to Kathmandu, which was like a 40, 50 minute heli ride in a helicopter filled with um, jugs of uh, jet fuel because that's how they operate there. Like literally, instead of sitting on a seat with your legs yeah. down, you're sitting with your legs like bunched up on top of a bunch of plastic bottles of fuel. I was like, ah, oh, this. How is this? <laughs> how, how, how What is this situation that I'm in? And then the uh, the weather was turning, and we almost missed the gap to leave. And then we were flying through fog in between these mountains. And I was like, I don't know. I mean, this might be it. And like, at least if I go like this, it's a it's a damn cool story. <laughs> but then yeah, we made it to land, and they've got um, at the airport in Kathmandu. They have a um, a curfew for flights. So after a certain hour, hour you, couldn't you couldn't land. And if we would have missed that, we had to, I don't know, fly back or it would have been hours and hours and hours delay. And we made it with like two minutes to spare because of the, <laughs> the pilot's experience. It was one of the craziest things that I've ever done. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, wow. What's time that? lapse tales. <laughs> time lapse tales, isn't it? When people say time lapse are so boring, you're like, no, dude, you don't yeah. realize what happens behind the scenes yeah. when you are shooting that bloody mm. time lapse. And then the funny it. thing is, it was like a three week shoot across, or three and a half weeks across all these countries, shot, you know, 60, 70 really cool sequences. And I think in the show, they ended up using five or six. Yeah, that's always the yeah. case, isn't it? Mm. I still have all that footage. I'm like sitting on it. I should make a. Um, a video out of it. I've got like a hyperlapse, like eight hyperlapse shots of the um, of Mount Everest, the whole mountain range flying um, past it with mm. like clouds and stunning, oh, stunning that's stuff. Yeah. Sick. Wow. Yeah, I really have to make a, a video out of that. Definitely make it. <laughs> yeah. Are they quite okay with you using that footage? Uh, I've got to check. It's in the contract somewhere. I think technically, yeah, I don't know. Mm. I think I can use it because they didn't use it. Yeah. Because usually when we work, it's like if they have posted it mm. or if they've used it, we can use yeah. it then as but well. But they didn't use any of that footage. So <sighs> I think I can do it. Yeah. I think you can do it. You just don't tag them <laughs> and be like, yeah, that's what I've done. Hey, <laughs> yeah. amazing. Thanks for sponsoring and paying for that. But this is what it is. <laughs> yeah. It was Canon at the time that um, mm. that produced or funded. I, can, I think yeah, they funded the shoot. And then it went on that geo. And then I think Netflix bought it or something. Oh, nice. Yeah. When... When they approach you, do they come to you and say, hey, Matt, I know you're doing time lapses. Can you then, and they basically maybe drop your locations and then you say, okay, I think this and this and this location geographically might do the best trick. Or they usually have a producers who have a very kind of good idea of what they want to see as a final result. This was for a uh, production company in Sydney. So they had planned the whole shoot. And then I came on board as time lapse operator and um like sound, mm. like boom operator as well. So mm-hmm. whenever I was not shooting time lapses, I'd be helping out um, with whatever, really, like a couple of B-roll shots and uh, some sound recording as well. So they had 
you know, they had the whole itinerary. Yeah. Um, so I, it's kind of a run and gun approach. There was no location scouting for me. There was like, we're here now. Do I have time to set up a time lapse? Yeah, let's do it. And then help out with the rest of it, like lugging gear around and, and all that stuff. Um, very different from other shoots where it's like, all right, Matt, I need you. I mean, most often, mostly I get put on a shoot and people don't really know how time lapse works. Uh, and they're like, you do you, <laughs> you go do your stuff over the next two or three days. <laughs> and I do it, you know, uh, I kind of, you know, scout on my own and uh, work with an assistant to get stuff going. But every now and then you work with a, a production company or a director that knows exactly what they want. And that's mm. fun because then it takes away a lot of the pressure. Yeah. Because if they're like, we need this shot, this shot and this shot. And if then something comes in between, like weather or other circumstances, you've done your best and they know it's, it's, it wasn't your fault. Whereas if it's a shoot where they're like, you go do you and they don't really understand anything and something goes wrong, you know, weather wise, they might not always get that. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, time lapse comes with certain limitations. It does. It definitely does. And I think with time lapses and hyper lapses in general, sometimes not so much with time lapses, but I think with hyper lapses till the point where you get the pictures in your Lightroom mm. and then you put them all in one sequence you don't realize how, like, if it's, are you safe? Oh, yeah. But, I mean, yeah. So I was, you know, speaking time-lapse, hyperlapse is a whole other yeah. beast because it's, it's there, there's so many things that can go mm. wrong. <laughs> I know. And it's just one, it takes sometimes one frame to go wrong. Yeah, yeah. You shake your hands, you mm. put it in the wrong thing, and yeah. then boom, you know, yeah. you can put that warp stabilizer as much as you want to. Mm. <laughs> you only can God, take it that far. go again and again and again. I know, yeah. I know. It's, um, I mean, you know, I've been doing hyperlapse uh, like commercially on, on, you know, big pay shoots for the last seven or so years. And mm -hmm. still, when I get hired, I have to explain the risks that come with hyperlapse. The fact that it's so incredibly time consuming, so many things can go wrong that, you know, they might end up paying for a whole day of shooting, but you, you walk away with a handful of sequences or, you know, whatever. Um, but, you know, I've got a lot of really good clients and people that understand the, the art of hyperlapse. So that, that stress that I used to have about it, like, oh, you know, I'm getting paid, but do I know if I can deliver or not? Mm. That's kind of gone. Obviously, with, you know, years of experience, you get better as well. And Absolutely. you kind of can call a situation like that's going to work or that's going to be incredibly difficult to stabilize. Yeah. So let's go with another shot. And it's funny, like when we did um, the whole um, New York stuff, then we were flown out to do eight, I think six or seven hyperlapses. And I think what helped us is to be extremely realistic and also like use the time and always calculate it as if like it's 120% of time. So we literally yeah. said, over, we need yeah. over all the time over whatever we thought that that's going to be one extra day in the middle of those crazy, you know, timetable that for us to kind of don't go sane, that was just an extra day. If the weather is not going to work out, if anything else is going to not mm. going to go the way that we wanted to. So, and I was so glad we did it because at the beginning mm -hmm. I was like, no, we don't need to be that, that, that for that many days. You know, they will feel like as if we're using them and then blah, blah, blah. And, and then I was like, thank God we did yeah. that. Because always... if you don't and it, it goes wrong, then, then you've wasted time mm. and money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks that's for... a waste of money. Yeah. yeah a little bit. You're yeah. like, oh, all right. Mm. That's what happened. But hey. Yeah. But then coming back to the YouTube views. Yeah. Um, right. So it's, it's quite an interesting topic, I think, in mm. general. Uh, I guess with the years you perhaps don't measure yourself or your success on the views you get on YouTube mm -hmm. or how does it usually work? Views to me are just a number. Mm. As much as I say that it still hurts when you put a lot of time and effort into something that you feel like could be getting hundreds of thousands and it gets like 1500 views. Mm. But <laughs> because it's happened so often, I've kind of gotten used to that. So I can make a video um, and it just doesn't go anywhere. I'm like, look, the people that watched it really loved it. So I look at the comments and I look at the um, likes to dislikes ratio and that ratio on my channel is insane. Like mm -hmm. it's 98% or something. So I very rarely get uh, people that really don't like stuff. And the community that I've got, the people that watch my stuff, the people that comment, share how they feel. It's really, it's just such a nice, wholesome community of viewers that I have. And I really, really enjoy that. <laughs> I think if I didn't have that, Maybe I wouldn't have still been doing it, but yeah, views wise, you know, I blew up once on YouTube in 2013 and that, and then I, I think the next year I had another kind of, not super viral, but you know, I had some articles written about it and some, um, quite a lot of views, a couple hundred thousand. 
hasn't really happened since then. Even though I feel like I've made stuff that deserves more, that could have gone more, you know, bigger. Mm -hmm. And I, I look at other people's videos and I'm just like, oh, I don't really get why this is getting, you know, 60, mm, 70, yeah. 80,000 views. I mean, I do get it because they're in a different, um, yeah, I mean, geographically, if you're in America, it's... You will always get a better... Yeah, if you're in yeah. LA, New York, uh, you know, Toronto, Vancouver, look at, at... You mentioned Peter McKinnon earlier and his crew and Casey Neistat, Sam Schiffer, those guys. It's That's what we've lacked in Australia for the last six years is a, a proper YouTube community of creative people that create stuff with which you can build and grow together. I was... It was, it's, it was starting to happen in the last year in Sydney. Like, I found a nice little group of people diverse content but everyone's really switched on everyone's really driven and motivated mm -hmm. and then you know now i'm in london so i've got to find a new kind of like crew to yeah. to do stuff with and i met up with one guy um danny i think something no andy andy burgess burgess uh he's also on the boosted boards um ambassador team i guess so he made some boosted board stuff mm -hmm. and he's like yeah it's hard to find that um crew here it's which i found very surprising because i didn't i didn't know anyone in london before i moved here and I was like, oh, there's got to be this big hub of creative people, like, you know, the crew of Matty Hapoya and, and Peter and, and those guys. Or if you look at L.A., I mean, L.A.'s got so many people. I know. And London, despite the, you know, being the biggest city in Europe and having such a, a huge area and so many, you know, creative agencies and, yeah. and, and, and marketing agencies, there's not really that crew of creators i'm sorry to bring it up here yeah unfortunately <laughs> this is the case that so it's good to meet people like you guys where yeah. you're, you're also creating we're very much in the same space so it's good to to have that and that's why i want to you know I, I get a lot of questions like hey can we meet up in uh london or like can i you know join you on a shoot or mm. whatever which i love getting but it's like if i say yes to all of those i, I won't get anything done so of course. my goal is to do what i start doing in belgium and in sydney is to organize these uh, creator meetups with the sole purpose is to bring creatives of the same city together so i started this um almost like a pop-up style event um which i still have to figure out a name for but i did it in antwerp and like 15 or 20 people showed up and it's kind of like i did a little talk about my career and what's happened over the last years with you know social media and what that's led to and following your passion mm -hmm. blah 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 but the goal of that was to just bring people in the same room and then kind of speed date so yeah. at the end of it you know you sit them in two rows across from each other and get them to introduce themselves in two minutes. And and that was cool. Uh, I want to be able to do that in every city. So I'll be doing that in London, hopefully soon, but I've just been traveling too do much. Yeah, <laughs> but I will be doing it in London. I want to do one in Amsterdam. Mm. I'll be in LA in uh, November as well. So, I mean, LA doesn't need that, but it's good for no. me for networking. Of course, <laughs> no, absolutely, yeah. Because I think only now, and I don't even know why is it happening or why is it taking such a long time to get to that point? Because there's only like a couple of street photographers who are just only now starting doing the whole meetups. And usually, yeah. more often than not, of course, you have like 30, 40 people coming in. Um, I'm not going to lie, not every single one of them is successful mm. in terms of I can go and shoot myself. I do, you know, I... I'm happy to do that. I don't need any motivation for me to go and do it. Whereas a lot of people are so insecure. And I think something that, of course, not a lot of people are talking about, but it's just you're ending in, in that pool of insecurity sometimes. Mm. And it's just, you're trying to get creatives on board who maybe not on, necessarily on the same level as you are, but that having that drive and passion mm. and that hunger to get yeah. to that point is just to get those people out of those meetups would be the best. Yeah. It doesn't happen often, unfortunately, but hey, it is what it is. And I was also surprised, as you just said, in London, you would expect. Mm -hmm. But it was funny, I have some people here who are working for YouTube. They even have a YouTube studio here, but they don't yeah, even have a YouTube curator or anyone who would be actually like a YouTube page on Facebook for London. It's non-existent. It probably has I've 10 heard that, subs. Yeah. I went to the... Um I think the opening night of the YouTube Space London when they did like their, I think they do a weekly, mm. you know, session on, on Wednesday or Friday or whatever. Yeah. But Have I, you been to that? I haven't been, but yeah. um, I, well, I, I know a friend who works for them. So she was like, we're meeting a Google campus. She's like, hey, that's what we do. Like, if you're interested, pop around. But basically it's like, you can only use the studio if you have like 10, 10K mm. plus subs, which is understandable, which I don't have. Yeah. Uh, but she I'll was just like, bring you in. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> I think I can bring this But, <laughs> um... I looked at the Facebook group and I was like, Paige, and I was like, what is this? Oh, so there is nothing. a page. Well, there is a page, yeah. but it has 10 subscribe, su subscribers. <laughs> and the last news probably was published yeah. a year ago. Yeah. And I was like... And someone, the admins probably left and has gone work somewhere 100%, else. Yeah. 100%. And I was like, Bummer. why? why? Mm. Like, why? You have a space already yeah. here. But what also happens with London is... For, and I guess it probably happens in every single big city. Like, when we come across amazing 
curators, creators, they all move away. Mm. Eventually, they all just go away. Yeah, what's with Brighton? Why is everyone in Brighton? I don't know. Is that just because there's a beach? Is it a summer? <laughs> That's what it was. Come September, everyone's going to be back to London. There's so many people in Brighton. It's wild. Um, it's I've never more been, chilled. so I don't really know what it's like. It's definitely like. more yeah. chilled. And you have that sea level. Like, I come mm. from Tallinn, mm-hmm. which is you know, located on the sea. So I'm like, yeah. oh my God, I love it. But Brighton is a bit too too small for me at the moment now. So, yeah. um, but I understand the appeal mm. in a way. It's not as yeah. crazy as London. If you are happy to be in this constant hustle, bustle. Mm. Um, yeah. um, I quite like living in a city. I mm. mean, London's way bigger than Sydney, but I grew up in Antwerp or like the Which outskirts is, of Antwerp is quite small in Belgium. Mm. It's, it borders with Holland, quite foresty um, and just way, way different from any city. So, Moving from Antwerp to Sydney was, wow, you know, living in a big city, mm. also on the other side of the world, which is very exciting and, and all that. And then I moved to London and I'm like, oh my God, this place is massive. It's massive. It took me, you know, forever to figure out subways and like how how far you can go <laughs> <laughs> and just, on like one, like, you know, looking at the map, I traveled 40 minutes or like 30 minutes on a train today and it's still like it's still bang too. in London. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, it's wild. But it's funny, like, do you do you feel, when you're in London, do you feel inspired to shoot time lapses and hyperlapses? I am. The only thing that's kind of stopping me is, like, a lot of people, like, there's just such an obsession with banning tripods and, like, you can't do this and you can't do that. And, is um, that in London on Lazen Ed? Did you come across such, oh, a, like, strict in, rules in everywhere Sydney, else? In Sydney, in Sydney, the only place where you can't have a tripod is, like, the grounds of the Opera House, because mm. that's a private, like, privately yeah, it's owned. privately owned, isn't you know? it? Yeah. So, but here, like, along the water, which you would assume is, you know, public walkways, lands, it's like, no, everything's owned by the everything buildings. Everything is and, owned. Yes. Um, so, like, today I've got my bag, because I'm uh, shooting some stuff with a new camera. I need to shoot some time lapses. I've got a little tripod, and I've got a clamp, because I've, you know, one of those magic clamps. I've heard from people that, Security guards are briefed on if you see a tripod, they just that's jump not allowed, on you. Yeah. But they don't know about those clamps. So oh, they're just like, eh? Yeah. <laughs> so I'll just find a railing that doesn't shake too much. And I'll do that. <laughs> Absolutely. Because we, obviously, we're coming from London. So we went to did some stuff for Westfield. We had to go from loops and loops of marketing mm. people to know that we we're going to be coming in. And of course, when we went there, every single security guy was coming at me. And I was like, this yeah. is the email. You can show it to all your gay, uh, yeah. like to all your mates, because I don't want to spend another 15 minutes to explain exactly mm-hmm. the situation to all of you guys. Yeah. Um, went to shoot in Westfield in New York, the Oracle. Mm-hmm. Nobody gave it. Really? Nothing. Because wow. we were like, yeah, and nobody even Maybe came they're more to used us. to it. I don't know. Well, it's because there's it is so a much more tourism. touristy spot yeah. for sure. Mm. Yes. But then you know you see a guy moving step by step by step with the camera for the last 40 mm. minutes it will raise some questions doesn't it yeah. so we kind of at the beginning we were a little bit more discreet and then i was like you know what i'm just gonna do it till they're gonna say to me just you can't do it and nobody yeah. came and we we're like oh my god but i'm mm. in america i would assume in america people would be a little bit more even cautious about it but it seems a very british thing to be honest too yeah it's all very about, you know uptight <laughs> <laughs> i'm not gonna lie it is yeah, yeah. hence our hypers are all handheld yeah. purely because yeah. You can't use a tripod. Well, that, it's more efficient to shoot. You just make so many more hyperlapses on a handheld thing. I saw a guy at uh, Liverpool Street Station this morning. I think he was doing a, a hyperlapse through crowds with a tripod. I'm like, mate, Ooh, good luck. Good luck with Looks that. Looks horrible. He had a high vis on, so he must have been, you know, kind of knew what he was doing. Mm. But still, it just takes forever. Yeah, it I takes. love shooting handheld so fast. You could do tw- two sequences just in case you yeah. know, have one subject and... Yeah. Well, always do, but at some point when you just take the camera off, your eyes are like, "What's mm. going on?" You know, like you see the dots literally everywhere, <laughs> and you're like, "Okay, crisscross is what's going 100%, on." Like, yeah. You're like, "Okay, adjustment yeah. time, adjustment yeah. time. What is going on?" Wow, lovely. Yeah. Um, so, what's your favorite project you worked on so far? Ooh, good question. I know. <laughs> um, there's a lot. There's a lot of stuff that I've really, really enjoyed over the years. Uh, but one that really always just stands out is um, when I went to Vanuatu in 2000. Ooh, I want to say 15 or 16 um, for a tourism campaign. So Vanuatu is an island nation of, uh, it's close to Fiji, oh, New Caledonia. Cool. It's a three and a half hour flight from Sydney. And it's like, it's absolute paradise. Uh, sadly, they get hit with cyclones quite a lot because mm. it's, you know, South Pacific Ocean, they just get ravaged. And Cyclone Pam in, I think, 2014 or 15 really hit them really hard. So a lot of the resorts, hotels, Infrastructure just got absolutely destroyed, wiped out, and they spent a whole year investing, 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 rebuilding stuff. And after that year, they were 
you know, finally done. But all the media was ever talking about is like, you know, don't how, go how because, bad it was. Yeah. So then the tourism board or a marketing agency, I don't know where it originated from, but they ended up flying over a couple of influencers, I think about 10 people, including myself and a lot of my friends that I met mm -hmm. through Instagram, you know, years ago, which was really quite fun. So we all got to go to this paradise island and you know go to these like waterfalls and resorts and these super cool cultural experiences and meet these people they're like the friendliest people in the world and shoot stuff all for this great cause of helping these families to survive and everyone there that we met was aware of what we were there for mm. which i think is different from when it's like a bunch of travel agents that come there to see what the hotels look like so they can sell it They're like, oh, you're here to help us. And like, we met families and they were all so grateful Aww. that we were there to help them. And then, you know, that was just great. So we got, we got to be part of this, I guess, campaign um, to, to increase tourism. The traffic, yes. Yeah, yeah, increase traffic. Because, you know, no matter how you look at tourism, if you love it or hate it, it did support so many families. So to be directly involved with that was wonderful. And then a year and a bit after or two years, I went back um, with a friend to talk about climate change and how, you know, those cyclones are affecting the um, Especially now, I think countries. they had an Australia summit as well, which kind of didn't go... Oh my God. I know, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> talk to me <laughs> about that. The Australian government's just the absolute worst. It's funny, mm -hmm. I moved from Belgium, which has, you know, we had the record for the longest run of not having an active government, you know, almost two years we didn't have uh, <laughs> an active government. And then and I was like, oh, I'm leaving this behind, I'm moving to Australia. That's going to be better, you know. They know what they're doing. Those guys know what and they're doing. And then, like, yeah. Tony Abbott got elected, who's a bit of a right wing nutcase. Mm. And then, um, and now I'm in London, which is great government wise. You know, you guys are killing it here. <laughs> Smashing it. <laughs> The whole Brexit thing. Bananas. Mind boggling. So, I mean, yeah, I don't know if it's me that's causing all these things or <laughs> it's just generally the world's going <laughs> Please don't go to Estonia in this case, my other one. Let's just stay away from that part. <laughs> um, But yeah, so I went uh, back to Vanuatu with my friend, uh, Jeff Reed from New Zealand. He's like an environmental activist and mm. um, we shot some things there. We shot a documentary. Um, this is also a bit of a failure on my part because life just got so busy. We shot this entire documentary, kind of like run and gun, shoot all these stories as we went along. Mm -hmm. We were there for about two weeks and then I edited some, like I rushed an edit together for a climate, um, it's the, what's it called? The Summit, uh, climate summit or something. Yeah, a big climate summit in Europe. And I can't remember the name right now. But um, I made this documentary for the Vanuatu division to take with them to show there because they're like, hey, because we, we got, you know, film permits and drone permits for our, I mean, it's not a commercial shoot, it's a passion project. But we still decided to do the right thing. So mm -hmm. we paid these permits because we were like, you know, this funds the, you know, the right directly. offices. Exactly. Yeah. But then I rushed that edit together because they're like, oh, we're leaving next week and we need something right now. Made something like a 12 minute piece that they loved. Um, and wanted to show at this climate conference. And then I never actually finished that mm. documentary. So to me, it's always in the back of my head, like I need to sit down, grab all my hard drives, grab all the footage and finish this thing because the stories that we shot there are worth sharing. And they're so, they're so heavy. Like it was such a, it's such a beautiful place to be and beautiful people. But what they're, they're saying, like literally these quotes of like, you know, it's, It's we're acting like we're putting in these efforts, like we're setting up um, marine sanctuaries, like because all the fish are gone, all the turtles are gone because ocean acidification, coastal erosion, um, literally like their coasts are like disappearing. They've got stories. There's these big banyan trees, which are like the center of their uh, towns. Mm -hmm. Well, they're not towns, they're little villages. villages. And there's these stories that the elders tell her like kids. It's like, oh, the banyan trees, they're walking to the to the ocean. Mm hmm. And then they fall in the ocean. So we've got footage of these massive, massive trees, the size of like, you know, a warehouse almost. Oh. Um, big, big trees, size of houses in the water. Uh, but, you know, what they don't see is that it's just very slowly eroding their coastlines away. And it's, you know, the ocean's like getting closer and closer. So they're literally, it's almost as if they're just drowning and they're trying to solve this. And they've got, you know, animal sanctuaries in forests where you can't hunt anymore. And, and like the trees, they... Their whole the biological clock and the rhythm of the islands is all Just warped is, is all messed up because of climate change. They would have they would plant roots or or vegetables, and if this tree uh, blossoms, like if the flowers, that's when they have to take those out. But that rhythm is off now because of the changing oh. climate. So we have all these stories and all these footage that is so you know hard hitting. Well, it's extremely educational as well. Wow. Yeah, and mm. and they're like it's so annoying because like the West is burning up the world and we're getting hit hardest and and first you know not only 
with these cyclones that are getting more intense and, and more frequent, but with all this other stuff as well. And so, yeah, I've got this whole, can make this whole short documentary about it, but I just, I don't, I haven't found the time to, mm. to, cause I don't want to, it's, it's part of my perfectionist perfectionism fault. I talked about this in my last video. I don't want to, I need to do it the right way cause it mm. deserves to be done the right way, but now I'm not doing it at all, Yeah, which is a fault for many creators where they try to do it and then they help. The, you know, they try to do it the best way and they don't end up doing anything because 100%. it's like, that's such a mind, you know. And it's funny you're saying that because usually, I mean, I'm not, honestly, I'm not trying to be a sexist here. I think usually guy, girls are definitely more in the heads, but it's, mm. but the guys that can see that you just like grab your bag and you go and you're like, yeah, well, we're going to deal with mm. whatever's going to come my way. But it's with girls like, okay, mm. we need to discuss what's going to be happening <laughs> right now, yeah. right here. So yeah. I never thought about that as a gender thing, but yeah, maybe. And it's because I work yeah. with Jan, whereas he yeah. goes, we're just going to do it. And yeah. I'm like, oh. You mean we're just gonna do it? Must be nice. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I wish I just my brain just goes 350 miles in a second, going like all the things that potentially can go wrong. And I think the longest time, like a self battle, was for the longest ever was that just do it. Mm. Don't care how you're yeah. gonna do it, just do it. Yeah. And it might be fear, and I don't understand what you're saying. You know, it needs to be done in the proper way. Mm. But at least something done, I guess, is better yeah. than not done yeah. at all. What's isn't that it? quote? Um, done is better than perfect yeah that's the one I think it's just one of those things that Peter was also talking about and I think that a lot of people are like yeah what you mean like, what are you saying to me I need to do it half assed yeah. now and they're like no just do it that's all you need yeah, to just do just do something just do enough. something yeah, exactly. and, I th and I think it was the same mentality when I started putting this stuff on Instagram of course everyone always thinks it's the easy to take your mm. phone out and a snap and that's the beautiful picture you know like nobody really realizes how much work does go into it um, but even if, if even if I wasn't happy with the picture, I will still put it out there, despite everything going inside me like, oh, you shouldn't. Yeah. You know and why? Then, it's just because I can go scroll back to it and be like, this is how bad it used to be. And yeah. that's how good you are now mm. in that certain level. So that perspective, I think, yeah. I think it needs to be there. Yeah. And then from a stats point, do you find that when you post something that you're not, you know, crushing on that you're not in love with that it like blows up and then a piece of work that you've that you're like this is perfect mm. i've spent weeks on this shot just kind of goes nowhere i have yeah. that so often and mm. i'm like how does this i don't why you know i'm supposed to be good at social media because it's a large part of my income my job my work mm. but i still get baffled so many times when i'm like when i post a phone shot <laughs> that i still love doing to show off, I mean, you know, I've been working with like something, but also like the fact that you don't have to have expensive gear to create things. Correct. Post something like that. And then people are like, oh my God, it's amazing how you did it. How did you do that? I'm like, <laughs> just well, the phone. <laughs> just do what I usually do, but I shot it on my phone and I don't love it as much, but like the, the stats blow up. Maybe it's because it's more approachable. Maybe. I don't know. Also, um, you know, obviously you don't have to look at likes and, and all that to um But do you think every single time things. you do something and it generates more likes, does that then determine what your next step will be? Mm. Good question. Not really for mm. me. I know what I like and I just make things. You know, I mean, I've been doing the same stuff for mm. <laughs> seven years and mm -hmm. I still feel like every time I post the hyperlapse, people discover that for the first time. Oh, like, yeah. whoa, how did you do that? Is that a drone? Is that a rail? I'm like, no, man, it's the same thing I've been doing for seven years. <laughs> Um, but um, oh, I, was ha I had a good point. Uh, oh yeah, so in Australia, um, all of my friends they no longer see likes on Instagram now. Yeah. So they've uh, put that in. I think Canada had it for a while, and seven other countries. And because I've been in the UK for a couple of months, my I guess in the back end, my account's no longer listed at as Australian. It's now UK. So mm. I still see likes, but all of my friends, like a lot of like beauty influencers and vloggers and 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 all those guys, they don't um, they, they don't, don't see, see likes anymore. Yeah. So I. I think it's a good idea. There's a lot. There was a lot of hate about it, but a lot of love as well. And from, generally, I think the majority of those people really like that. It, it, I think it removes pressure as a creator that you know that's what we were talking about. These likes and these numbers and engagement ratios. I think it's it's good. And then obviously the reason that Instagram has done it is not for us creators. It's for younger people's mental health or at least yeah. that's what they're saying that's what they say what the, whereas, the pr you know yeah the, whereas then i read was. i read um like a an it guy and he's like i think it's because they were spending too much money on the live updates of the like numbers oh, like updating. the caching of that they're like that's got to cost so much energy to run those servers and showing you the live updates i'm like 
I know nothing about how that works. Yeah. But if that's actually something that could be the case, then I believe that that really could be the case. It might be one of the factors for sure. Yeah. Because if that's kind of like, yeah, doing the justice, not justice, they're doing the service to the public, mm. but then also cutting a little Just bit of that. It. I mean, it's Facebook after all. So <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't I be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised as yeah. well, to be honest with you. Wow, that is an interesting way of looking at it, isn't it? But I think when it comes to you sourcing the job or getting the job, what's the then, how do people find you? I, or what do you think yeah. was has been the most kind of successful platform to people then see where you're up to? Instagram, Instagram's been pretty good mm. in Australia, but uh, the majority of my work has always come from word of mouth. So mm. you'd work with a person and then, you know, they recommend you or get the odd thing from, I think, SEO based from my website. I don't think I get a lot of work from YouTube mm -hmm. besides the odd campaign for um I'm doing a Panasonic thing right now, for example, and they somehow figured out that I moved to London, even though I haven't really announced that I'm mm -hmm. in London. So it's possible that they're using software um, to, you know, find inf like an influencer recruiting platform I'm or sure. something like that. Yeah. I mentioned earlier that Instagram knows that I'm in the UK because mm -hmm. the Australians don't see likes anymore, but I still see that. So maybe it's something like that. Um, but yeah, generally majority of um, work has been via just people like it's a people's yeah. thing anytime i do a talk about you know how i turned my hobby into my career i'm um, at the end i give like a couple of key points key takeaways and it's always all about people mm. that's been my experience for the last um seven eight years of doing this commercially can i agree more mm -hmm. same for us it's just the thing sometimes just say that get that one right person and eventually that can just blow them into so much stuff yeah into so many more things mm. yeah wow that is exciting how yeah. is the new panasonic camera it's fun. It's bigger than I thought. So it's the the S1, the mm. Lumix S1. I thought it was a smaller camera, but it's still, it's quite big and heavy and bulky, but it's very powerful. It has a lot of, um, a lot of stuff like is, is crammed in there. It's got like a dedicated time-lapse mode, which is obviously what I'm going to be talking about. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm over my 1DX Mark II, yeah. which is for, the, if you don't know what it is, it's a very big, very heavy, very, um, it's like a workhorse, you know. It is a workhorse. It's built for stupidly, you know, intense environments. Um, Olympics, Antarctica, <laughs> you know, <laughs> high performance stuff. But I, I use it as a vlogging camera for the last couple of years and, and time lapse camera. And it's just too big for that. Like it's, it's overkill and it does a lot. But this Panasonic almost does the exact same amount in a slightly smaller form factor. Mm. And I've, I've Honestly, just all the traveling, it makes you tired. It makes you a bit weak. And I've pulled my neck and back a couple of times from lugging around too much gear. And I'm over that. Yeah. Like, all right, prioritizing my health now. Definitely. I need to find something that's more compatible with the amount of travel and just, you know, I need more comfort and not more weight. <laughs> I, I agree with you because my same friend we went to Kilimanjaro with, she's a wedding photographer. She works and runs around with her Canons, you know, Mark D Force and all that kind of stuff with extremely heavy lenses. And I was just like... Why? And she's like, well, because of the color, because of this, mm. it's this, the quality. And I'm like, okay, you need to look at something lighter. <laughs> there is no need for you to carry so much equipment around. Yeah. And I understand you've been working for that for 13 years, but mm. then she kind of took that advice and now she bought Sony a7 mm. Uh Obviously the colors are what they are, but yeah. everything else seems Sony to be quite colors. all right. Yeah. Sony colors are Sony colors, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So apparently, because I've been talking to people that have been shooting Panasonic for ages and they're mm. like, yeah, Panasonic's colors lately, they they come... There's the second one in line after Canon, okay. which I, I've only shot with it one day and haven't really properly reviewed the footage. But yeah, I'm very impressed with the camera. It's got, you know, so many things built in that I'm like, oh, this, you know, when Canon brings out a camera, they often let out a couple things. And I'm like, why would you not put that in? Like the EOS R, their first full frame mirrorless camera doesn't have a time lapse mode built in. Yeah. And I'm like, the one DX need doesn't have it. But every other entry level camera has a dedicated, like at least something to do with time lapse. And then they kind of you know, block, is it to not cannibalize, that's what people always talk about, to not cannibalize their own sales. Like, oh, if you want that, you need to buy this that and this camera. and this and this. But I'm like, the EOS R, it's a flagship, you know, mirrorless thing. Do we have to wait for the pro model? Probably not because the one the X didn't have it. So then you need to buy a $300 remote. <laughs> And it's just- That's all it's much just, fun, isn't it? Yeah, 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 it's yeah, just $300 remote, isn't so it? So it's cool to see, you know, it, it for me, there's a lot of loyalty with Canon because I have been shooting on Canon since I started, you know. Mm very first camera has always been Canon and I've done a lot of work with them. I've made, you know, advertisements for their new cameras and I've been involved in campaigns and there's always been this unspoken kind of loyalty and almost exclusivity. Mm -hmm. But, um, 
uh, yeah, I, was, I think I was just ready to try something else. And then purely from a, you know, from my own point of view, SEO wise, the more content I make about time lapse on different types of cameras, the more hits I get on my website, the more, you know, views I get, the more okay. uh, money I can charge for of traffic course. Or, or views, I guess. So, um, yeah, it's exciting to try a new camera after only ever shooting Canon. And mm. Panasonic's cool. It's just a bit heavy and big as well, but still smaller than the One X. Yeah, but it brings me to the same thing. You see, mostly, even like my Fuji now comes with a time-lapse um, kind of feature in, which, you know, that's fine. Um, GoPro, now that's hyperlapses. Mm. So that, when we heard about that, we were like, whoa. <laughs> Okay, we really need to start thinking of how can we still go around it, right? Yeah. How do you uh, push yourself? Or how do you separate yourself from... Yeah. Yeah. And it's an ongoing battle still. Mm. Um, but, yeah, how does things like that the make first, you... The first time I experienced something like that is when I um, when Hyperlapse... When Instagram released their Hyperlapse by Instagram app, and everyone was like, oh, Matt, you're, you're done. Mm. There goes your work. And I'm like, yeah, okay who's going to hire a hyperlapse photographer that shoots with their phone? Yeah. yeah. Um, again, the way I always talked about this is the fact that it's becoming more and more mainstream is it means that more and more people are seeing that technique as a, as something that exists as a yeah. creative, you know, direction. And so they will then look for, if it's a production that they want to do, they'll look for a professional to do that. And then luckily we're in that realm of professionals that do hyperlapse photography and they'll look at your past work and your your portfolio or whatever, or find you through other people. The only thing I think that those apps in hyperlapse mode on GoPros or whatever have done is is increased uh, the work for people like ourselves that are commercial time lapse and hyperlapse photographers. You don't want to be working with a company that would lowball you or hire someone that shoots on a GoPro. Uh, well, we've been approached to yeah. say, um, "Can you edit that footage?" And I was like. <laughs> I'm good, thanks. <laughs> you know, it's obviously you know it'll it'll happen um, more and, and more. Uh, of course, yeah. But yeah, I think generally it's been a good thing, which is opposite to what people have thought it would be yeah. for uh, people like ourselves. Yeah. When you look at it that way, that actually it, it does make sense, yeah. Because mm. it's still, I think a lot of people who come to us, they're like, "What is this thing? What is it called? I don't understand yeah. even how you do it." Mm. And it's just like, yeah, that's that's what we do. So. And, and also then on the other side, the fact that it exists, uh, the fact that I can shoot uh, hyperlapse stuff on a on a Hero Seven Black on a GoPro, mm -hmm. that opens up another, uh, I guess, realm of, of of work of possibilities. When the client doesn't have a budget for you know two three thousand dollar a day shoot when when it's shot on DSLRs or mirrorless cameras and a big production crew, you can offer an, a lower budget, a lower class of content creation where you still, you know, you apply your all your professional knowledge to this smaller form factor of a, of a camera, of a production, mm -hmm. and make stuff uh, with that. So then it depends on you as a creator, like, do you want to fit that in to your, I guess, your, your gear of, you know, choosing projects to, to focus on? I, I say no to quite a few things due to, you know, them not having the right budget. Like, I'd rather say no to four things and so yes to one thing that has quadrupled the budget and then just spend a chunk of time dedicated on that as opposed to working with four clients with low, lower budget that don't really get what it's about, don't have the experience because you're just going to waste so much time. Yeah, I agree with you because the energy and amount of time that goes into pre-production still happens no matter mm -hmm. how much to pay or not. Yeah. It's still, it's totally. still you, you still need to put that work in. And, I, and in a way, as you just said, yeah, sometimes just you need to concentrate on one big thing around just like spread yourself and the quality will go down and eventually that will not be good for them, not mm. be good for you because portfolio-wise you can't really go and showcase that. <laughs> exactly, Because yeah. that's just going to be like, well, not really, yeah. thank you very much. Mm. But um, how do you feel about working for free and do you think that is that is an important bit of course i understand building your portfolio that is understandable mm -hmm. but now let's say somebody will come to you and say this is about the climate change mm -hmm. or the topic that is very important to you or you are mm -hmm. you know connected to it but they say we don't have a budget yeah um what will i mean i know it's uh, yeah i mean the whole working for free working experience you can't pay money with exposure that stuff mm -hmm. online everyone's like it's it's this or that. It's very black or white, which mm. is never the case. Like that's not what life is, even though a lot of people act like it is. Mm. Um, I've you know I've done stuff for free. I've done I've helped out production companies or friends companies or I've you know worked for a hundred bucks a day or like a, a train ticket or you know. Um, 
depends on depends on you as the creator, as the the I guess the production crew, how busy you are, how involved you are with what it is, with the cause. If it's, uh, I mean, obviously you shouldn't be out of pocket for something. Um, I've donated my time to uh, TEDx, for example, because they're, I mean, they're a non-for-profit and. What I wanted at that time was to be able to put TEDx as a client on my website. Of course. So I shot one shot for them, Hyperlapse, stabilized it, sent it off for like two shots, and they were happy with it. They didn't have budget. And I'm like, well, you're emailing me from TEDx. You're getting paid for this. So like, why aren't you paying your creators? But then I'm like, every other, you know, time-lapse shooter in Sydney was getting involved. And I was like, oh, fuck it. You know, might as well just do it. And yeah. Have that on my on portfolio. It's yeah. like, bang, you know, TEDx. Even though it's one shot, it's still a client, you know? It's still a client. But uh, yeah, other stuff, it's always, you got to weigh up all the factors. There's no, I don't think there's a, uh, there's a, an easy response and every case is different. So yeah, I mean, I've done work for free. Do I recommend people working for free? Of course not. We all mm. got to, you know, uphold the standard and the, 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 this industry. Uh, it, the, again, no one wins, you know, in a race to the bottom, we're all going to no. lose. So undercutting um, other people shooting rates. I am always very open about what I charge with fellow shooters mm -hmm. um, to, to have a, a standard across the industry, of, you know, what we should be, what our time is worth. Mm. When people come in to an industry and try and disrupt it by undercharging because there's, you know, a GoPro function, that, again, that's a different type of production that's not going to impact you that much because that's not the client that you want to be working with anyway. Correct. Um, and then there's, I was talking about this yesterday, young, because I started in music festivals uh, doing all this time-lapse, hyperlapse stuff. That was such a hype thing. So many people wanted to do that. So they'd be like, I'll come and work for free if you just give me access. And it's like a big, big thing. And it's half the reason I stepped out of that industry. But um, I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> it um what was i gonna say oh yeah it just you know the rates just kept dropping and dropping and dropping and no one no one wins there so you know if you're gonna step into an industry and undercut everyone like good luck making that a sustainable long-term career you can't how are you gonna you know so think, charge you know proper value um yeah. obviously you know i've got my set rate uh but i have got a minimum that i work for yeah. i can go under that but ideally you don't um and then also, you know, pricing depends on the company that is inquiring. If it's someone on Instagram like, hey, we'd like to do something with you. Or if it's a, you know, a pr production crew, like a, a producer that's getting mm -hmm. in touch for BBC or for, you know, something big. That's a way different thing. If it's if you're working for a Google that wants to use that footage on a global campaign or if you're working for a little coffee shop down the road that has got you know 200 bucks for a video it's always different um, it is extremely yeah. different isn't it yeah but i agree with you it's also the conversation i had with my mates and i was like you need to look at it in a perspective if you're a hobbyist you can charge 150 pounds per i don't know a video just because it's your hobby and that's mm. money extra for towards your lens or something like this if it's your full-time job i'm sorry you can't get away with yeah. that it's just there is no way mm -hmm. so simple as that so that's yeah. that's the way it kind of goes plus the invoicing like especially here in the uk i don't know how it's in australia mm. easily four to six weeks mm. and that's not oh even. really is that standard here month okay that's what you're looking at yeah us is like three months I've done it. Three <laughs> months. Stupidly said yes to some of those. I'm like, oh my god, it's it's been it's been forever. Like, oh, it's a 90 day payment. I was like, yeah, cool, whatever. And then I'm like, wait a minute, that's really long. Mm. I don't even remember what I did. Of course. <laughs> when it's three months later, and the and money comes, I'm like, oh yeah, sweet. Oh yeah, if it comes. Sometimes it doesn't. You yeah. kind of go like, excuse me. Mm. Um, but yeah, here and it's the funny thing is the same company can will still will still pay you within two weeks, mm. but then they can which means yeah. they can mm. but more often than not it will be yeah. it will be 30 days yeah. so um but maybe i'm just like expecting it to be like this because usually yeah. when you work with the companies it's like oh i needed it yesterday and you're like mm -hmm. of course you did of course yeah. everything had to happen yesterday yeah are you always i mean depends on the timing of the project but it's always 50 percent up front and yeah. then and then after and that, i mean that's just that's my terms they have their terms of for whatever mm. um but yeah again it's the type of client you choose to work with that you know and like 80 percent of your income probably comes from 20 percent of the clients that yeah. you have so you gotta protect that 20 percent you have to protect them that is yeah. so true um i think i think i think we covered quite a bit yeah today this was great that was lovely yeah i think again yeah thanks for coming in my pleasure i hope you're gonna stay in london for a little bit longer than yeah you know well yeah i will be i don't we don't have a timeline i used to have timelines for my life and then 
your life changes. I was going to go to I know. Australia for three weeks and I ended up staying six years. Six so. years. <laughs> Crazy. On the other side I of the world. I know here. And so Amelia's, is, um, you know, she's got a visa for a few years with her work, but she's already like, oh, maybe we'll stay longer. And I'm like, look, yeah. I'm, it's going to take I'm it easy. as it is. Yeah. 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 Anyways, thanks for having me. This is really fun. Thanks for coming in. Yeah. And let's go and shoot one day. Sounds good. Yeah. Let's make work of it. Awesome. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for everyone for listening and bye. See you guys. Bye. Yeah. Sweet. Sweet Jesus. Because what happens, I'm going to do it. What's an absolute legend. It was such a pleasure to sit across one of my favorite YouTubers and chat all things photography. You can find Matt on YouTube at Matthew Wonderput or Matt Joes on Instagram. Everybody, thank you for listening. I have some amazing guests lined up, so stay tuned. Meanwhile, you can check my Instagram at Top for the daily behind the scenes. Thanks. Bye.